This is the meeting of the Administrative Committee of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management Bo uh, Board. Um, all three committee members are present. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Okay. Um, so this is uh, the time in our meeting with the public. Do we have any? Let's see who we have. We have three meeting. members. Okay. Uh, is there any member of the public that wishes to um, provide comments to the committee at this point? Um, during the meeting, if you do wish to make a comment, you should feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so. No, no member of the public has raised his or her hand. Sarah? Correct, no hands are raised. Okay. So let's go to the action items. The minutes of the October 11th meeting. I don't have any corrections. Uh, Director Malik, Director Anderson, do you have any? Or no. Or I move to approve. Second. Okay, let's do the roll call, please. <coughs> Director Malik? Yes. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Paul? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Okay, item two the uh, Montgomery uh, groundwater modeling item. Yes, so. Even though it says direct me to do so, this is a, um, a John Lear uh, water master support uh, topic. Yeah, and thanks, I, Dave. Oh. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, uh, committee members. Um, good afternoon. Um, as Dave stated, this is a um, uh, an effort to get um, our groundwater models uh, supported. Um, we utilize two groundwater models, um, one for the Seaside Groundwater Basin, and that supports, it was developed um, in the Seaside Groundwater uh, Master TAC, um, which the district sits on, um, and it was developed in about 2009, and it is updated and it, it's the model that's been used predominantly by consultants and Monterey One Waters consultants, which are actually the um, Montgomery is uh, the consultants that have supported the um, Pure Water Monterey and all the modeling in that fashion. Um, this uh, $50,000 piece of money was uh, put into the budget when the 21-22 financial year budget was um, um, put forward, and it had a slightly different um, purpose we were going to uh, move forward with this. Um, over the last five years, myself and Thomas Christensen, along with um, a uh, USGS employee named um, Richard Nieswanger, uh, have built um, a model which was called the Carmel um, Hydrologic Basin Model. And it uh, is being used actively in the Los Padres Alternatives study to compare what happens with the different um, Los Padres Alternatives. Uh, we had uh, originally put this $50,000 in and intended to contract with Richard and the USGS. And our intent was to uh, update the Carmel River model to current, um, it cur it's current through 2015. So update it and check its calibration. And then also bring the Seaside model in-house to the USGS and have the ability to um, simulate both of the basins together as we move forward into um, using the, the basins in a different way as we move off the river and move towards the supply out of the seaside basin. So it was to give us the ability to test many different scenarios, including climate change. Um, Thomas and I were notified by Richard that the USGS has had some internal reorganization and he had taken another job to which him and his group were no longer able for us to um, 
to use them as support. So um, with the intent and spirit of the line item, um, I reached out to Montgomery, who is already familiar with the Seaside model. And instead of onboarding the Seaside model to the USGS, the solution was thought to on, onboard the Carmel River model to Montgomery to give us the same functionality. And so um, we did receive a um, letter proposal, which is included as exhibit 2A, which talks about uh, onboarding it and bringing it on and then giving us the ability to run different scenarios. Um, it's envisioned that this, this is uh, a recurring line item in, in the fiscal years that would be to retain um, Montgomery and use them as needed um, to support the district's modeling as we move forward with development of water resources. So it, it's just a slight pivot from um, what we what we had uh, had as verbal agreements with the USGS um, to be with Montgomery now. Thank you, John. Well, I have some questions, but let's um, first see if uh, Director Malik or Director Anderson have questions. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, it, the same fee applies to Montgomery. I'm the fifty thousand, the fifty thousand dollar budget. Correct. It would be the fifty. So the conversation, um, in, instead of um, asking the USGS, uh, what would it take for you to bring the the um, seaside model um, on board to you? It's um, what would we have. Um, what would it take to bring the um, Carmel River model over to Montgomery? And it fits within the $50,000. And it has, if, if you look on um, some of the back pages of the portfolio, it doesn't actually take the full $50,000. And it has some, some um, money sitting there if the district were to want to ask Montgomery to do its own independent model runs, if it was um, wanting to you know, test different scenarios than say the Seaside Water Master wanted to in the Seaside Basin. Thank you. Well, yeah, um, Director Anderson, do you have any questions? I don't see her. Director Anderson's muted, I think. Amy, you're muted. Yeah. I said, uh, uh, Safat asked my question for now. So go ahead, Dr. Paul. OK. Uh, well, my one question is follow up to Director Malik's question, and that is uh, about the scope. Um, and it seems like you anticipate future work beyond the scope of this, this proposal. And can you give us some idea of the scope of that work and the, you know, what it is likely to cost? And well, related, yeah. related question is how this modeling, how far, far out in time does it, does it go? Sure, the, there are, uh, well, th it goes, um, the Carmel River Basin model uh, begins in 1991 and goes through 2015. It's it, and so to your question of what scope would be um, moving forward with the Carmel River model, it would be to use the scope that's defined in this letter proposal and then understand the level of effort to bring. We have the data sets to bring it current to 2021, but we, we need to, to add these last six years. So the, you know, you, then you actually do extend your period of simulation. Um, typically, these models are used where if you want a longer period of simulation, you would um, you would loop them um, and just run them back to back and have as many years as you would like to um, to get a longer term. Um, you know, if you're doing, uh, for say, climate change, or if you wanted to simulate what is 50 years of operating pure water Monterey due to this due to the Carmel River Basin, it allows you to have um, questions like that. As far as um, the so you can Similarly, sorry to interrupt, John, just so I understand. Um, you can simulate different scenarios. 
for yeah for example the the carmel river basin um when you build the uh, models you get your historic data you get your historic climate and you get your historic pumping data um, and then you um, calibrate your models so that it's predicting um, groundwater levels and river flow within industry standards so there are industry standards that are set by academia on confidence intervals of your questions and what um, what you're allowed to say or not based on your simulated results. And with those, um, we currently have are using the Carmel River Basin model um, in the Los Padres alternative study, um, where we've done different scenarios. We've taken the historical historical scenario. How do we get to where we're at? Um, what does it look like if Los Padres stays in and is not dredged and we're at the CDO pumping? What does that look like if you actually moved, removed Los Padres? Mm -hmm. What does it look like if you dredge Los Padres? And what does it look like if you dredge Los Padres and put a rubber dam on it? So we have these set of scenarios that we've turned over to the technical review committee. And so that's in the process of being written up and likely, you know, coming out of the technical review committee will come a recommendation um, from NOAA and CalAM and, and their consultants to update the model to current um, to current uh, year and um, probably another set of scenarios that people um, have interest in looking at. Um, for, for us um, as the district, we've typically used models like this to technically support uh, um, our, uh, our water rights when we do water rights petitions. So it's, it's being used for other purposes for Los Padres, but we've typically used models like this to show that diverting water at the different times of the year that our water rights allow us to is doing no damage to the river. Uh huh. And, and can you can you take into account different rain rainwater conditions, different you know look dry years, wet years, and so on? Yeah, they're both um, what's called mod flow models and so mod flow is is you know an abbreviation of a code um, it's the um, code that the USGS uses so it's a federally accepted code it's able to be it's accepted as um, technical testimony uh, in court so it has a standard to it um, you know, that's why people pick it it is a precipitation driven model so the pre the precipitation falls on the ground and 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 flows into channels and then and seeps into the ground um, and then is removed out of wells. And so it gives you the ability to change your inputs of precipitation, change your inputs of pumping, um, ch change impounding water at Los Padres is basically what we're doing with the Carmel River. Um, with the seaside, with the seaside, what we're doing is changing recovery scenarios of the Calam well fields and, and linking that to tracer testing so we can um, prove that we have the um, required log removal and, and virus credit. So um, we're, using, we're using both of them, but there's a, there's a desire moving forward to hook them both together so as, because the systems are linked um, because they're mm -hmm. <laughs> linked by pipes. Good, yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for answering all those questions. Any other questions or comments? Um, any comments from the public? If you'd like to speak to this item, please raise your hand now. I see no raised hands. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, So uh, do we have a motion um, on what we want to recommend to the board on this item? I think this uh, reworking of the model, updating it, supporting it makes all kinds of sense. So I recommend uh, approving it to the board. OK, I'll take that as a motion and I'll second it. <laughs> Sounds like important information that we definitely want and need. Um, let's, so we have a motion and it's seconded. Let's uh, do a roll call vote, please. Director Malik? Yes. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Paul? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Thank you. Treasurer's report. 
Good afternoon, committee members. This is item number three, which is the adoption of treasurer's report for the month of August 2021. During the month of August, we wrote checks uh, in the amount of $1.27 million. And if you look at page number 15, that's exhibit 3A, which is the actual treasurer's report for the month of August. Uh, as you can see, we started the uh, month with $17.7 million in the bank, and we finished the month with $17.9 million. Uh, all of the activities for the various accounts are listed. Typically, what happens from July through November, we are in the spending mode. We receive uh, revenues, but not uh, as much as we get in December because of first uh, property tax uh, collection and the water supply charge collection comes in December. But through July through uh, November, you will see expending and money coming in only for the uh, uh, user fee from Calam ratepayers. And now uh, we also get money for the uh, PWM water sales, but that's a direct pass through that comes in and then goes out uh, the same month. So uh, and the only reason for my comment is that typically you'll see the balance, the cash balance decline from July all the way to November. And then in December, you'll see a big jump when the uh, when the property tax and water supply charge comes in. Exhibits 3B, C, and D are attached. Uh, exhibit 3B is the uh, listing of all the checks uh, written for the month. Uh, 3C is the payroll register. And then 3D is the unaudited financial statements for the month of August. So with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you, Suresh. Are there any questions? Um, I just have a question about some, some of the larger, to find out what some of these larger um, expenses are that I don't recognize yet. And what is uh, ACOM Technical Services? What do they do for us? Uh, that is the Lost Padres Dam Alternative Study. Ah, okay. And Tyler Technologies? Uh, that is the annual maintenance support for the financial software. Uh huh. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Oh, I see. Echo. Okay. Any? Um, if there's a member of the public that wishes to address this item, this would be the time to raise your hand, please. See no raised hands. Okay, thank you. I move so, to approve. Thank you. Uh, I'll second that. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Malik? Yes. And Director Paul? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Thank you. Okay. Treasurer's report for September. So yes. again, members, this is item number four, the uh, uh, consider adoption of the treasurer's report for the month of September. During the month of September, we wrote checks in the amount of $2.1 million. Um, and then we also paid out uh, rebates uh, in the amount of $63,000 and change. Uh, exhibit 4A on page 27, you can see we started the month with $17.9 million and our bank balance uh, at the conclusion of September was $16.2 million. This is one of the months where we also paid the extra uh, additional payment to a mechanics bank loan, $500,000. You will see that reflected in the check register. Uh, exhibits 4B, C, and D are the same exhibits as I had mentioned in the uh, previous uh, report. With that, I uh, can answer any questions. Yes, Director Malik, did, are you raising your hand? Director no, I'm Malik? not. No, okay. Any questions from either director? Not for me. Okay. I move to approve. I'll second it. And I see no raised hands from the public, so. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's vote, please. Director Malik? Yes. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Paul? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Okay. Um, 
So these other items are, are just to receive certain reports. Item five. Yes, item five is that, which is to, because we concluded September, so that also triggers the first quarter activity for the financial activity and the investment report and the investment one is the follow-up item. So this is the first quarter financial activity um, for fiscal year 21-22, uh, that is through July through September. And I have summarized all of my bullet points in terms of uh, revenue for each section and also expenditures for each section. So. I won't go through each of those lines, but if there's any questions uh, related to this, I'll definitely uh, answer those. Exhibit 5A is the table um, uh, explaining the, uh, or outlining the revenues and expenses. And then exhibit B and C are basically the same information that's listed in A, but in a graphical format. So what's in the other revenue category? Uh, it's, uh, you do say, and by the way, thank you for writing up the summary. It's very helpful. It's very clear, but um, just this one point, you do say um, that it, this category includes reimbursement revenues from legal and other miscellaneous services. Um, just can, you don't have to tell us everything, but can you give us an idea? Uh, correct. So, so legal reimbursements is basically when uh, people go through water demand division to uh, do the permits and there are legal fees associated with that they pay us. So that's basically a reimbursement to us. Uh, there's also insurance reimbursements. Uh, the reason why the uh, other category is a little bit higher uh, than what was anticipated is because we received our uh, insurance reimbursement through SDRMA. What happens is at the uh, beginning of the uh, fiscal year, we pay for uh, workers' comp insurance. And then as we go through the year, at the end of the fiscal year, when it closes, we conclude and we reconcile our payroll to the workers' comp uh, premium. And uh, most of the time, there is a refund at the end of the year um, because we anticipate our payroll based on the budget, but then the actual payroll because we haven't hired people, uh, so it doesn't materialize. So we end up getting refunds. So it's it's kind of like a catch-all. Um, you know, uh, any, anybody requesting PRE, I mean, uh, uh, requesting copies of the board minutes or board packets, we charge them a small fee. So all of those kind of like go in the other revenue category. Thank you. And um, I had a question about the permit fee, the permit fees for your connections, you said came in higher than anticipated, which kind of surprised me since we have a, a moratorium in effect and I wonder um, how, how is it that we have pulling more permits than expected under these conditions? Yeah, so it's not just for new connections, but basically if people come to do uh, remodels or any of those, they still draw a permit. Um, uh -huh. So all of those, we kind of like basically take a guess every year and every year we kind of like miss it. I mean, sometimes on the uh, higher end, on the upper side, sometimes on the lower end, uh, it's kind of like a kind of like looking at the crystal ball and saying how many permits are gonna get pulled, but uh, it's not just new connections. So yeah, you're right, they are moratorium, new, no new connections, but uh, for renovations, uh, people doing uh, um, remodeling uh, projects, that's still going through. Um, and if a rem remodeling project would entail more water use, can they, can they do can that? I can help with this, Suresh. If someone were to uh, permit and drill a well, they would need, if they were sharing water across parcel lines, they need to get a water distribution system permit that has connection fees associated with it. So it's private sources of water that are still regulated by the district. So it's a People are, are, you know, say you say simplest one is if you go in on a well with your neighbor or something like that. And so. Yeah, and then in, in addition to that, there's also the credit where basically do the uh, high, high efficiency, high efficiency uh, washes and dryers and uh, uh, credits uh, materialized from those. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and, and so on the water permit side, the, the line that says capacity fees. Yeah. <clears throat> That would be an increase in fixture units for a, a remodel. Um, it would include new water permits issued where you can get a new connection. So under the Pebble Beach entitlement, under uh, the Malpaso entitlement, um, you could do new construction with a new connection. 
Um, so whenever anybody expands their use um, and we issue a, a permit through examining the, the pre-project and post-project water use, then we charge them a capacity fee unless it's being done uh, based on credit that they somehow have established. Now, are you calling that a capacity fee or a connection fee, or are they the same? The yeah, same. It, used to, it used to be called a connection fee, and we changed it uh, okay. definitely to capacity fee. Okay. Because the description in the um, in the notes here are, ex are they're exactly the same for capacity charge and permit fees. So I I wasn't wanted to be clear about how to distinguish between the two of them. Yeah, Stephanie uh, Locke is on. Joelle, if you or um, Sarah, if you can move her over, um, she can probably add a little more clarity to the difference between the two. There she is. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. So the um, permit fees are actually fees that we charge for um, processing fees. I believe that that would be where we would kind of call those uh, permit fees. Mm -hmm. The capacity fee is, as you have been discussing, if there's an increase in the number of fixture units or the capacity at a non-residential site, then they pay the capacity fee for that increase. And as Dave said, it can come from an entitlement um, it could come from a jurisdiction's allocation, particularly the city of Seaside has uh, water still available in its allocations, and they've been um, allowing a rather large number of accessory dwelling units to go in. And so that would be, um, those would probably have a capacity fee associated with them. But um, in Pebble Beach, it was mentioned, Malpaso, um, and then the Laguna Seca sub area, um, also is not currently under a moratorium. So there's construction in Hidden Hills and um, some of those other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Any, um, any member of the public wish to speak to this item? No raised hands. Thank you. Okay. Um, I move that we recommend at the board receive and file this activity report. Second. Thank you. And let's do a roll call vote, please, Sarah. Director Anderson? Yes. Director Paul? Yes. And Director Malik? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. Move on to item six. Well, item six is similar to item five, which is at the conclusion of September, which triggers the first quarter activity for the investment report uh, in accordance with the district's investment policy, which is uh, approved by the board every January. Uh, it requires uh, uh, the district to produce a quarterly uh, investments report. And so this is that uh, quarterly investments report. Uh, it is uh, in compliance with the investment policy, uh, basically does have uh, sufficient liquid funds to meet anticipated expenditures for the next six months. And then it's also in compliance with the California government code and the permitted investments uh, that's allowed for the Monterey County. So the actual investment report is on page 53, which is the exhibit 6A, uh, as you will see, we've categorized all of the different uh, uh, liquid funds where we keep them. Uh, most of them are parked in the local agency investment fund or the uh, multi-securities bank uh, staggered CD investments. Uh, and then we do have the money market and the checking account, but that's basically just a float where, you know, we have to keep enough in there to be able to uh, meet the, as we cut checks, we are able to pay those out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the total amount of the power value is $16.2 million. We also re uh, are required to uh, the report the market value of the investments. And so you will see both the cost basis, the power value and the market value for uh, all of the uh, assets we have. And then in the bottom part of it, it's just again for reporting purposes, we are reporting on the uh, um, 
uh, Pebble Beach uh, reclamation project uh, numbers as well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question about that. Um, I'm just, I, I can somebody Please. describe to me why we have, I guess I don't really understand the, the money being in, in this reclamation project. Right. Bank. How does that work? Right. So the, all of the, all of the finances for the reclamation project are actually run through Carmel area wastewater district and their CFO. Mm -hmm. um, except for the water purchase and um, some tax compliance expenditures that we handle for uh, the certificates of participation that were out there. So, um, but, it, but it's part of our uh, audit as an enterprise fund of the district, because in order to secure the certificates of participation, which is, <clears throat> think of them as bonds, um, but they're, they were invented to get around uh, certain bond approval requirements in California. So we call them COPs. And the security for the COPs is the purchase of the water on an installment sale basis over time. And the district is the seller of the water and was the issuer of the COPs. And so in this four-party relationship, uh, as I said, all of the <clears throat> physical assets, the investment in capital, the O&M expenses for the reclamation project are handled by COD and the physical facilities are on COD's premises. The Pebble Beach Community Services District owns the pipes and a tank and some other pertinent features uh, related to the, uh, the reservoir. And then our district owns the water in the pipes from the plant to the point of sale to the uh, seven golf courses and the Robert Louis Stevenson School. And so it's our ownership stake in the water that drives the installment purchase agreement, which secures the COPs. And that's why the enterprise exists on our books, even though we don't own any physical assets. Thank you, Dave. I know you've explained, <laughs> not the first time you've had to explain this, but it's a, a little bit complicated, but I, I, I'm getting the picture and thank you. Yeah, and actually, the, and the COPs will be paid off in, uh, I, would, I think in mm -hmm. 2022. 2023, I believe. You know, I'll have to look at that. I think uh, there was some discussion at the RMC meeting about that. But anyway, it's almost the end of the era. Of uh, and then and then there will probably be a push at that point by COD or the Reclamation Project Management Group to perhaps move the enterprise fund out of our uh, domain. But I think our pushback will be if they ever need to do a capital borrowing, it, it would be the same structure, and so uh, it will make sense to just keep it currently residing with us. Thank you. So I take it it's not um, doesn't require a great deal of work, uh, our staff time. Uh, it does. We charge it off, but I mean, we do the billing. Um, and so we bill. Do we actually receive and then transfer the proceeds, Suresh? Yeah, you know, we bill and we collect and then we transfer it to a card account. Yeah. And then uh, we have quarterly meetings, both at a technical level and then at a managerial level. They have to complete their enterprise fund audit before we can complete and approve our overall audit. So we're always up against <clears throat> trying to get our submittal of the comprehensive uh, annual financial report um, for GFOA qualification for our uh, annual award on transparency and information. And so uh, tomorrow, the Reclamation Management Committee will meet to approve the Enterprise Fund audit so that we can then fold it into ours. Okay. 
Any other questions on this? There's one thing I wanted to point out while we're on that exhibit 6A. Six, six yes. if, you, if you look at the uh, multi-securities bank securities, these are uh, typically uh, insured certificates of deposit. Um, but one of the things I wanted you to notice, if you look at the first two that we purchased in 2018 and uh, was holding for three years, you can look at some pretty nice uh, rates of return in the 3%. Oh. If you go down to two of the ones at the bottom, these are actually recent purchases of five-year CDs, which should have a higher yield. Um, as you go out in the yield curve, the longer your maturity is typically a higher yield or a higher rate mm -hmm. of return. And you can see the woeful rates of return that we're now seeing even for a longer security. And that's just what's going on in the marketplace. So our interest earnings have been uh, kind of downward uh, due to the market pressures. And so I just thought that was kind of a stark uh, contrast to see what we're, what we're getting. And then that trickles through to the local uh, agency investment fund as well, because they have a pool of assets that's managed up at the state of California level. And the state can only invest in certain types of things, all of which the yields are uh, way down from where they were three years ago, four years ago. Thanks for explaining that. I was noticing the three year, then the one four year, and then a bunch of five years. And it's like, hmm, it seems to be going backwards. So, yeah. 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 Are the rates going up currently? No, we're not seeing that at all. It's hovering about the same. And if we invest into a three year CD, you'd probably almost get about 0.3% or 0.4%. So it's not even worth investing into a two or three year CDs at this point. Mm -hmm. And we're banking right. on that we make more money on the five year CDs, even though. We've locked into five years, but coming over the next two, three years, it'll actually pay off. Good. Well, I guess, you know, if, if there's, if you have ideas for optimizing our returns, I'm sure you will bring them up and, and share that with us. But I imagine knowing the expertise the two of you have that you, you believe this is the best available at this point. Am I right? Yeah, given the limited uh, nature of our investment policy, it is. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? I'd be very surprised if there's any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item, but if you do, please let us know. No raised hands. Thank you. Okay. So um, I move that we uh, recommend to the board that they approve this first quarter, quarter investment report. Second. Thank you. Let's have the vote, please. Director Malik. Yes. Director Paul. Yes. And Director Anderson. Yes. Motion passes 3-0. And so the next two items, the seven and eight are just informational items. But if there are any questions on that, we can definitely take those up. Any questions on these two items? Director Malik or Director Anderson? I did have a question. Um, on the, where did it go? Right down. Um, Which item? The, the, it, well, it's 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 on eight, but it's in it's it's about the LAFCO, um, the recommendation that we add yeah, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, we're going to cover that under item nine. Okay. I was going to highlight that one. <clears throat> Looks like there are no red flags in any. All no. right. Well, no comments on eight for me. Okay. I don't have. <clears throat> looks like 
Let's move on to nine then. Great, and item nine is the <clears throat> agenda for the board meeting next Monday. Um, there, I guess there is planned to be a follow-up closed session. Um, we'll have to talk to Dr. Garcia to see if in fact that's gonna happen. Uh, the uh, GM evaluation process is currently ongoing. Um, we have a separate session scheduled, I believe, for the 29th, which uh, we'll also pick up on the same topic. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to call your attention to, under the general manager's report, we will be covering uh, just another public announcement that we'll be looking for redistricting volunteers. And um, Joelle and I are meeting on Wednesday to run through all the materials we need. Um, and then we'll get each of the directors individually kind of a write-up for when you get a phone call or an email um, that you can pass along some information to the potentially interested parties. So anyway, that's coming together, but um, there will be an announcement under item 10. Hmm. I, item 11 will be uh, Dave Laredo. There's been quite a bit of uh, uh, activity to update you on or update the whole board and the public. Uh, the first item being the uh, what appears to be an agreement on the one page uh, water purchase agreement. Um, the MPTA lawsuit, uh, we just did a filing last week <clears throat> through our uh, outside counsel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll provide an update on everybody's favorite, uh, the LAFCO proceedings. And then I want to call your attention to the action items and some discussion item uh, discussion. Um, item 13, this went through the Water Demand Committee with a proposal for a cleanup ordinance. And so Stephanie Locke will be bringing the first reading of the ordinance uh, on Monday. Item 14, we have currently a request in hand from LAFCO for about $98,000, which is comprised of 20,000 of the contingency money for their outside consultant, 65,000 for what they anticipate are future processing costs. And then the remainder um, of 13, roughly 13,000 and change would be to cover the uh, current deficit that our previous payments have not yet covered. Now we're still about six or $7,000 from our limit, but we couldn't pay the uh, 18,000 that they are in a rearage of because we only have about six or 7,000 of authorized monies. We have authorized 20,000 for the contingency on the uh, Berkson outside consultant study, but we note that they haven't fully utilized the first 50,000 that we've paid. And so we're hesitant to send them the contingency money until they demonstrate that there's been, that they've been invoiced by their consultant. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll bring all of that to, um, to the action item in the staff note. Um, but you know, I just want to make sure you all know that we'll be at about $221,000 if we use this new request for $100,000. This new request does include money for, uh, it's a pass-through fee, but the Board of Equalization will charge to um, update all of the um, boundaries, the, the legal description of the boundaries uh, for the district. And I'm trying to find out what we think that's gonna cost. Our surveying consultant right now says they're gonna ask around um, because they do this kind of work, but no one's given me a, a firm number. So I, I think I threw about 20 grand max in there for that purpose, which brought it to a nice round $100,000, but I don't expect that we'll have to spend it all. So that's a big one. Um, and then the discussion items uh, Sand City Desal. Uh, when we did our first general rate case yes, filings, yeah, yes, did on sure. item fourteen. 
we voted to authorize $50,000 and $20,000 contingency. Correct. And now they're asking for an additional 100000 Well, so we authorized the 70 for the outside consultant. And then previously, we initially authorized, uh, well, actually, we they wanted a deposit to get started. So when we applied, we gave them an application fee of $7,500. And then we brought a uh, motion to the board to authorize the processing fees up to, a, I think it was 75. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 total, which included the already expended 7,500. And so now we're on that 80, we're at about 73 that we've already expended. So there's two things going on, the outside consultant and then just all of their, their inside hours for processing. And so they're saying they'll need another 65,000 of inside money for processing, plus the 18 that they've already incurred through the end of October that we've not yet paid for. Plus the, they're, they're asking for the additional 20,000 that we've already authorized for the outside consultant, which we're just hesitant to prepay at this point because they haven't expended all of the first 50 that we gave them. Do they usually provide you with statements of money that they spent? Um, thin statements. So th there will be a total for the month of August and a total for the month of September. Um, their components, uh, there's two components to their charges. Um, one is the staff time at an hourly rate that was, uh, I, I don't have it with me right now, but it was quoted in the application package. Um, and then their outside counsel is a pass-through. So they've got a, a uh, person from Best Best and Krieger who are advising them also. And so those are identified, but the actual number of hours, we would have to do the math to actually compute it. You know, we, we, we do have the hourly rate, but they just put a, you know, the, No, they, so, they, they with, each bill, with each bill, they do have a breakdown of hours in terms of what they spent the hours on. So they have a recap of each line item. Oh, they do? By day, yes. Yeah. It's attached with all of the bills. Ah, great. Oh, good. Yes, I had asked the same question as Director Malik. No, that, that's good to know. Do they also bill for LAFCO Council? I guess it's County Council time? It's all listed as passed through for the council and then also the uh, outside consultant on the independent study. They list that as a uh, uh, add on. And uh, one more question. Is this the way LAF goes all over the state of California are funded? That is the applicants fund entirely the processing, co the cost of processing their applications? Well, they do have a separate budget um, and their budget is funded from assessments on member organizations um, on, on independent uh, special districts and school districts and so forth. So they, they do uh, have a, a budget that's separate. And on more than one occasion, they've told us what great free services we've also been getting in this process um, that would be coming from, you know, that budget uh, through the, you know, the county uh, does appropriate money for them. So all in all, how much more are they asking? So they're asking for 98,000 um, as a check. Additional uh, money? Yeah. Um, of that 20 is the contingency on the consultant study, which uh, I've now communicated to them that we will send them that money when they show us that it's been expended. Um, and then the, as I said earlier, they estimated about 65,000 for the remaining processing costs. So that's just staff time and uh, materials. So does this need to 
I mean, there's in the phase two, there's a 257,000 um, contingency and miscellaneous. Is that something that could be moved over to LAFCO? Yes, um, but because it is an authorization and we know specifically what it's for, we just, we would want the board to sure. approve the public to know about it. Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and the reason for that, by the way, is we budgeted the uh, environmental work at a pretty high number, and then it came in at a uh, really reasonable number. And so that difference, which I think was about 300,000, wow. maybe a little over, became the contingency. And that's why when you see, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Laredo's number uh, is okay. negative. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, we didn't estimate that LAFCO was gonna take a whole year. We didn't estimate they were gonna raise all these issues. We didn't estimate that Manat was gonna write two letters a week and so forth. So, yeah. um, so it's kind of coming out of that contingency also. Can we tell them we're going to pay it after approval? Uh, yes. And I'm kind of hopeful that the motion includes language like that. The motion that the board will. Yeah. I, on the... Yeah. I don't think we have any. Um, th there's we're boxed in, so there's no way we can't approve the monies. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's best to talk about them publicly. So I'm going to I'm going to recommend that we authorize, but I would hope that somebody amends the motion to say that we only pay upon receipt of an invoice uh, retroactively instead of these uh, prepayments, especially as we get we get near the end. Getting a refund of any prepayment may take time, and we don't treat any other vendors really that way. We you know, we took the 7,500 as an application fee and we said, okay, that makes sense. You know, we can prepay that. And we know that that's gonna offset actual labor hours, but, you know, giving them 65,000 right now and then working on getting a refund later. Um, I don't, you know, I don't really think that's the best in our business interests, so. Yeah, yeah I'm sure, I'm sure we all agree. Um, but it's also, as you noted, you know, important that the public know how much time and money this is costing the public. I mean, yeah. just taking yeah. much more time and, and money than, than it needed to. Well, and I know we've had this conversation before where I've said, hey, Cal-Am doesn't pay property taxes. Their ratepayers pay the property taxes. And this is another case where the district isn't paying $220,000 to LAFCO. It's our constituents that are paying $220,000 to LAFCO. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And it will be important to remind the public of that. Yeah. It'll be an opportunity. Yes, I completely agree. It's a really important point. They're not CalAM, <laughs> it's CalAM's ratepayers that pay those taxes. So, yeah. and it's the same ratepayers that pay you know, the taxes for other things like schools and fire, the same people. Yep. You know. Yeah. So if they, you know, basically the expenses will, you know, come out of one, the charges come out of one pot and go into another pot so that the fire and schools and so on can be funded properly. Anyway. I, By the way, I, I love the research you did on County fire. <laughs> yeah, Director Anderson was a little mystified, when I, but yeah, yeah. At first, I was, and yeah, and I learned and then, why. And that was that's just the um, the staff, the cost of staff, the yeah. part of the budget yeah. that's always personnel. Very, very big. Yeah, to hardly be noticed. Um, it was a whopper. Yeah, um, very, so then very just, budget. just quickly moving on, the Sand City uh, desal replacement wells, we've re reversed our position uh, earlier in the rate case when we submitted comments. Uh, we cited a previous P 
PUC decision. And we said, yeah, you know, there's, there's other more important infrastructure. Um, this shouldn't fall to the rate payers. Um, but if the company wanted to pay for it, they could do so. Now that we've gotten <clears throat> over a year into the rate case and they're finally getting around to propose decisions, we've sharpened our pencils and looked at what the situation is for the next 30 to 36 months. And I've shared that with the board already about how tight we'll be until we get pure water expansion online. And so developing a new intake well for Sand City, uh, it's, you know, it's a million dollars, million two, but it really makes sense as a, as a buffer for this three year period. And then, you know, as a permanent, fix hopefully but we really need that water here in the next uh, two to three years so that's what that's for and then 16 may come off um you know i sent you around the notice that we're in a mask up order uh yeah. counting um so i think we're further from reopening than we were when we first suggested putting this on the the agenda for discussion yeah i do know that um you know, you heard the discussion last time where uh, it sounded like Director Adams would like to have in-person meetings. Um, Clyde reiterated that they've got a hybrid meeting uh, set up at the Monterey City Hall. <clears throat> We're much more limited in terms of personnel and space. Um, if you try to do a hybrid meeting, you know, it's a little bit, it's like juggling four balls instead of three. Um, you know, you, you can separate the, the skill set. So we'd need to really uh, focus on how we would do that and actually run the meeting itself. So, um, but anyway, stay tuned. It, it may come off the agenda. Okay. I have a question um, for, uh, this may be for the general counsel. Um, we had talked about at some future board meeting um, discussing how we want, what process we want to use for evaluating the general manager next time around, next time it's done. And that might be at a board meeting for December or maybe January, I'm not sure. But when I think of that, I can't think of any reason that would need to be in closed session. Um, but what do you think, our general counsel? Um, it's been my experience that even when you limit your discussion to process, that responses sometimes get into substance. And if you don't get into substance, then that's okay. Uh, you, you can be properly be in closed session, you can report out, but uh, it does constrain people's uh, comments and uh, more, very often someone will want to raise something in the, in the guise of talking about process, perhaps as to why there's a sense of urgency or alternatives or something of that nature. So my recommendation would be to go into closed session so you don't have to constantly be uh, concerned, are, are we reaching Mr. Stoll's privacy rights? I understand, thank you. Yeah, I do want to um, kind of related topic because we're now kind of focused on a calendar year rather than a fiscal year basis, we would want to establish uh, district goals and objectives probably in January or February. And if you choose to do so without facilitation from the outside, then we would want to do that in an open meeting. Um, and we can talk more about that when the, the new chair and vice chair uh, take their positions. Okay. So, do we have anything else? No. On on our uh, meeting for this committee meeting. No. I think we're all set. Well, thank you all. Then, thanks all for your work. This meeting <clears throat> is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.